All right, well, this evening, um, as we've been pursuing with the Q&A, it gives us an opportunity to work through uh, specific questions that you all have asked of us throughout the week uh, at different times, uh, whether it be uh, several new visitors have asked, we don't understand what expository teaching is, and so being able to walk through those things uh, or different, different aspects uh, of what that looks like and being able to interact a little bit more than just uh, walking through uh, a book or something else. And so with that, uh, a question came in this week, and it's one that I want to spend a little bit of time on and, and kind of intro a little bit. Uh, and the question was specific to uh, cell phones, screen time in your home, at what age uh, should children have them? There was a variety. There was one, one person asked and then an offshoot of multiple questions that we contend with on a regular basis. And I think some of that came from, if you're not aware, I had recently gone to a flip phone uh, from a smartphone. Now, I still use an iPad. I still have technology available. And so if I can just take a few minutes and, and walk through a little bit of the specifics of, of why that is or, or those things, as many people have asked that are aware of it. The thing uh, that I would say is, is very simply, um, for me, uh, there was a tyranny uh, of the urgent that these uh, tools that we're given uh, are intended to make our life more uh, able. Uh, it's intended to make life easier, so to speak, to make us more productive in those things. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, that was not the case. It just kept piling on more and more. And as I really examined how is this functioning, uh, there is a tyranny of the urgent. Uh, I read somewhere that uh, the average person checks their iPhone 81,000 times a year. 81, about every three minutes we glance at it. Uh, literally. Uh, I was a little surprised by the number, but then I started listening to the, to the actual statistical breakdown. Uh, people wake up and it's the first thing they do is pick up their phone and see what's going on. Uh, maybe you're just checking to turn your alarm off, but it usually doesn't end there. Uh, and so 81,000 times a year, uh, is that number right? I think it was in the book. Yeah, yeah 81,000, every three minutes or something like that. And so there's kind of a, like I said, the tyranny of the urgent. The second thing uh, for me was depth of relationship. Uh, we are losing communication uh. through these things. Uh, and maybe I should start before I get into even the reasons. Let me say this. <clears throat> this is an area that is very much open to uh, a multitude of views on it. Uh, it would be, for example, if someone said, is it better to own a home or to rent a home? You will find a multitude of, of opinions and other things across that spectrum. What I'll simply say to you is I think we can all agree that you ought not buy a home that has a sinkhole in the front yard. Right? There are dangers, there are common things that we can unite on, even with the difference of, of views. Well, cell phones, smartphones, technology, and those things, in and of itself, I don't want to present tonight that somehow I believe those things are wicked. That's not at all what I'm presenting. What I am saying, though, is if we're not careful with everything we're given in this life, anything can become an issue. Mm -hmm. And so just in examining those things, uh, there was a depth of relationship that lacked. It was easy to think, I talked to John Nelson today, and what that means is I texted, how's Joanne, and he responded, doing better, and I call that a conversation, and it's not, and it ought not to be, and it's, it's, it's very much uh, a removal of a depth of relationship that I think we're intended to have uh, as brothers and sisters. So those were the first two, and those are some of the more insignificant ones. The two that were most significant for me was distraction and discipline. Uh, the third one is distraction, and it was a little bit amazing. My wife uh, pointed this out to some degree uh, for some time, uh, how easily it could begin to overtake your, your time frame. Uh, there was a, a constant distraction, you know, an email comes through, and I didn't even have social media, I don't have social media. 
So you didn't even have those kind of alerts. It was emails or text messages or other things. And again, when you look at the average use, 81,000 times a year. Uh, and suddenly it would become an easy thing where uh, a legitimate text message came through from someone that I needed to follow up with. But at the same time, three sales, two updated videos on YouTube and something else. And I'm like, oh. Two and a half hours later, I've wasted two and a half hours, uh, you know, and been distracted from better things. Um, one of the things I would say in regards to technology, like everything else in our life, we have to really ask ourselves, what is it actually creating? In other words, if you order your groceries online and save yourself a trip to the store, what have you done with that hour? Have you spent it watching YouTube, browsing Facebook, or have you done something constructive with it? Has it actually improved to have that ease and, and availability? Has it actually improved your life towards the Lord, towards excellence, towards those things? Uh, and so those are examinations for that. So there was a, a great distraction factor that was, that was clear in having uh, so much information available. And then the third one, or fourth one, the final one that, that I could summarize it in was diligence. Uh, that thing could do so much that I no longer had to. And, and it would result in, I don't really need to read that book, I can just ask Google. Uh, I don't really need to consider that, I can just, you know, I don't need to learn that, I don't need to do that. And then on top of that, it would be emails would come in or other things and I find myself answering an email sitting at a red light. Well, there's not a depth of thought and relationship, there's just a, I can get this done. And so it was lacking diligence uh, in that. So those were the four areas. Uh, I want to give you a, a little bit of a biblical foundation as well for consideration. And I would begin at first in Romans 12, 1 and 2. And, and this is the point that I would make to you based on these verses. And this is going to apply into and feed into everything else that we're going to talk about, I believe. But I would say to you this very simply, uh, believers... The world is not your standard bearer. Mm -hmm. And we get caught up in that so easily where we begin to look around and think, well, I don't do sinful things like the rest of the world might do with their technology with their this or with their that. And I just want to say with all clarity, the world is not our standard bearer. In Romans chapter 12, we'll be there sometime in the future. And Paul has this to say. Coming out of his 11 chapters of foundation for what it means to be a Christian, he says this in, in verses 1 and 2. Therefore, or in light of these things, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. For what purpose? So that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. If you want to, if you desire to know and do God's will in your life, I can tell you wholeheartedly that being conformed to the world is going to hinder, limit, and, and muddy that completely. Uh, Paul's not only speaking in terms of, of sinful things. And, and this is where I want us to, to be clear. We tend to, and I've been convic convicted of this and concerned about this, really since we walked through the book of Jude, that Christianity in our generation has kind of established a pattern and standard of we need to not be like the world. Well, as the world is constantly moving further and further away from anything remotely resembling Christianity, if we maintain, for example, that we want to hold a thousand yard or a thousand mile distance from the world, but the world's now moved 50,000 miles from scripture, we're 49,000 miles off the mark. And that's the struggle that, that we run into as it pertains to raising children, as it pertains to our schedules and times and attentions and affections, as it pertains to marriage as it pertains to uh, the views of God and his character, his sovereignty, and other things, we, we have drifted 
so far from those things. And, and, and we hear this in, in Romans 12 when he says, listen, this is my urge for you, brother, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, not by your own strength, by what God has already accomplished that I spent 11 chapters telling you, that you would present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Right? And you think, well, that's, that's a unique verse. No, it's not. Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians. We talked about this uh, several weeks ago. And it says this in 2 Corinthians. For the love of chapter 5, verse 14, for the love of Christ controlled us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Uh, another verse that says very similar things and is maybe a little bit more well known is Galatians 2 and verse 20. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. These are all pointing to the same principle. That we would be those who are not conformed to the world. We would be those who... Uh, offer ourselves as, as living sacrifices. Lord, use me as you see fit uh, for, for whatever this life holds. Let me be no hindrance. Let me cast off anything which hinders me in the race that I'm running and the sin which so easily entangles me. Let, let's do away with those things. And so it's the same picture. It's, it's all over the pages of Scripture. It's not just found there. But there's an interesting passage that I want to point our attention to in regards to these things. Look with me at Psalm 101. It's a psalm of David. And it's interesting to me, as you're turning there, this is a, a vow that David's making in relation to his kingship. There's some controversy on whether it was made uh, when the ark was returned to Jerusalem and Uzzah had just been struck dead by the Lord or whether this was right after Saul died and David was instilled as king. But either way, what David's making this vow is in regards to his governance over the people. And it's interesting. You'll see that really in verses 5 down to 8. But he begins as he ought by looking inwardly first. And this is his vow before the Lord in regards to himself. And he says this. I will sing of loving kindness and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing praises. What a wonderful recognition of where we ought to begin in all pursuits of life with, with recognition, thankfulness, thanksgiving, and praise to the Lord who by his mercies has called us to these things. He goes on, he says, I will give hold to the blameless way. When will you come to me? I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip on me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will know no evil. And so these first four verses is David vowing that he will guard himself from the things that would hinder his role as king. The things that would bring him down, that would make him not be the man that God had called to king, a man after his own heart, after God's own heart. And David says, I'm going to guard that. I'm going to guard that. And then you see in the verses 5 through 8 where he works, works through his, his vow in regards to his kingship uh, to overseeing the people. And it's very specific where he's fighting against injustice, impurity, sin in, inside of Israel. And this is what he says. Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. No one who has a howdy look and an arrogant heart will I endure. My eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a blameless way is the one who will minister to me. He who practices deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who speaks falsehood shall not maintain his position before me. Every morning I will destroy all the wicked of the land so as to cut off from the city of the Lord all those who do iniquity. And so David's simply vowing that he will labor to see the Lord honored amongst his people. That's the simplicity of those verses. But he begins by saying, I will guard myself first and foremost in my own home, in the integrity of my own character and who I am, in such a way that it will guard those things as well. And very specifically, he says this in the, at the end of verse 2 and end of verse 3, I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. 
I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. And so when I speak in terms of distraction and other things, I'm not speaking as though that's something that, that I just came up with. As a matter of fact, if you want to know the truth, I fought against that being a reason uh, to, to not have an iPhone for, for me personally. Uh, and again, I still utilize technology. I still have an iPad. I preach from that iPad. You all see it. I utilize it for schedule and other things with my calendar. Uh, it's a calendar that requires Miss Bonnie, sometimes Miss Tanya Nelson, uh, Ransom, myself. Multiple people have access to add things to it and, and, and do things. So there's no way to do that with a paper calendar. Uh, and I'm not trying to say that technology is evil, that somehow the government's using it to spy on us. I'm not saying any of those things, whether they be true or not. I'm just simply saying in regards to what scripture teaches about the depth that I ought to have in relationship, what community ought to be for brothers and sisters yeah. as it pertains to my diligence and in, in discipline in both relationship, preparation, doing the work of those things, growing in that and not, not growing less because it's easier and I can just do it quickly. So for me, it was just a personal decision in regards to that. How do I guard those things? Uh, and people will say, well, just, just leave it in the other room. Well, I do think I should be able to be reached uh, pretty easily at most times. Uh, and so that's really not an option. And even if it was, as I would do things like that, I would leave it in the other room during dinner. But then one night there'd be something that I knew someone was in surgery or someone was having a crisis or something else. So it would come to the dinner table. And then the next night it would be there again. And I just recognized that, that maybe some people can do that. But that was an area that I was not strong enough to maintain week in and week out, month in and month out, year in and year out. And so the answer for me to be disciplined in that was to do away with it. So that's just some areas I know some people have asked specific to. Uh, why did you get rid of it? Uh, that's the, the, really, those are the four reasons. Uh, and again, I look at David and David says that in regards to his role as king... He has to guard himself first and foremost. And so for me, there was a lot of things. I, you know, I don't want there to be people who have the wrong idea that I was using it for sinful things. That's not at all the reason I got rid of it. I, like I said, I still maintain technology and utilize those things. But it was so easy for me to set. In light of what else was available, something worthless before my eyes. Uh, and so that's where, for me, I made that decision. And, and, and I'll tell you this, I'd rather get weaned off of sugar. It was a hard <laughs> couple weeks at the beginning because 81,000 times a year I'm looking at that thing. <clears throat> and so it was a very, much more difficult than I think, which just convinced me all the more of the need. And so those were some of the things uh, that really walked into that. And again, I understand uh, I'm weird. It doesn't, it doesn't match. Like, it's crazy. I go to places and they're like, just scan it on your iPhone. I'm like, I don't have an iPhone. I can't scan it on my iPhone. Can you give me a menu? Can, can you just tell me what this thing costs? I don't have an iPhone to do that. And they're like, what? The guy at the phone store, when I went in, he said, I've been here four years and no one's ever, not one time has anyone ever came in and downgraded anything. Everybody always wants more. Everybody's constantly upgrading. It's the only thing he knew. Their computer didn't know how to do that. Uh, he had to call someone else and get on the phone with the, the head of the whatever to be able to do me getting rid of the iPhone in order to have a flip phone. And, and I think that stands out to me pretty significantly. Uh, again, just bolstering the views that I held of why it was not helpful for me personally, the role that I'm to carry out, the role of pastor, but not just that, role of father, role of grandfather, uh, role of husband. Uh, there were multiple areas that, that were not what they could be because of that. And so to me, when I look at in culture, the expectation, in society, uh, the expectation, and then I look at scripture and putting no worthless thing before my eyes and living with integrity in such a way that that I am to the fullest of Ephesians 5, shepherding my wife and, and, and looking at those things, it was just a hindrance. And so Hebrews 12 seems abundantly clear. If there's something that hinders your race before the Lord that he's called you to. So for me, that was the answer 
Uh, I really didn't have a halfway answer that would work. I, I tried multiple things. And, and I, I want to start there, and, and you've already mentioned this, but I want to I want to kind of hit it again. We, we've talked even this week about how our hearts are prone towards legalism. Our hearts are prone towards, um, you know, what does that mean that everybody needs to get rid of their, their iPhone, that kind of thing. Um, and that's not what you're saying. No. Unless... Right. Yeah, I, I do think, you know, examine those things through the lens of everything I've spoken of. Is yours creating a hindrance? Is there a way for you to uh, do away with And again, I had to maintain some levels of technology for my calendar uh, and other things. So, again, it's not an anti-technology. It's just a walking with wisdom, uh, recognizing that this world is not my home, that Scripture is my standard. And if there's something in my life that makes life easier in the culture I live in but hinders the life of faith I'm striving to live, then I believe that this ought to win uh, that argument every time without even equivocation. And, and the other thing I would just say as an encouragement, it was a rough couple of weeks getting used to not having... Uh, my maps at my fingertips and being able to look this up immediately and check this out and see what the price comparisons were. It was a rough couple of weeks, but the benefits were almost instantaneous in those four areas I spoke of. And over the last month, uh, I, I would say that I don't even think that it's something that I miss, um, but it was a rough couple of weeks. Uh, but just the encouragement, those benefits have been uh, and again, I don't, my wife's here somewhere, but she could tell you pretty quickly, I think, that she noticed those benefits uh, towards the family, towards my time, towards multiple areas very quickly. Well, and I, I want to kind of start back with the idea of technology. And like you said, we're, we're not Luddites. We're not anti-technology. That's not what's going on with this. But even as you mentioned, and I think Eric Davis used a phrase like the, the, the lag where we tend to be kind of lagging behind the world just a little bit, and we think we're okay because we're maintaining that that distance, yeah. not recognizing how far we are actually from from the source, from the shore. Um, and technology, ultimately, in and of itself, it's a tool. It's it's just a tool, yep. and a tool is meant to serve, not to be the master. Yeah, if I had a hammer that started directing me around, I'd get another hammer. It, my daughter got a smart car of some sort, <laughs> and when I'm driving it, it starts correcting me. I'll never drive that thing again. <laughs> it's the craziest thing ever. Right, and, yeah. and I think with that, there's so much that we, like you said, we just take for granted. Like this is, I mean, I need this to get into, uh, you know, a baseball game. I need, I need this to get, you know, directions to where I'm going. I need this in order to, how would I go about without this. And so I think we can be so predisposed to say, well, I'm not using it for anything sinful, therefore I must be doing okay with it. And making that assumption, can you talk a little bit about what are some of the dangers of man, the, the, the subtle ways that we just grow accepting towards, you know, the, the pot boiling around us? Yeah, I think, I think that what most stands out to me as a warning is the recognition that culture goes the direction it, di it does because of the bend of their flesh. Mm -hmm. That's what they want. That's the desire of, of the flesh. Well, we have that flesh. And so all the things that culture's doing, maybe not at the level culture's doing them or society is doing them, but all the things they're doing, my flesh is drawn to. Again, maybe not all the way to the level of where they're at, but that's why David says, listen, I'm, I'm going to be ruling over the people with justice and equity, and I'm going, to, I'm going to have no impure people. And by the way, that begins in my own home. I'm not going to allow that to, to grip me so that I can do these things well. And so it's just, I think that's the subtleness is that we can, can tend to forget. Uh, culture does what it does because flesh enjoys it. It's appealing. It's appealing. And our, our flesh is prone uh, it has the same desires. So don't, like I said, you might not think that culture's gone 10,000 miles and it's way over here from where you grew up. And so you might not be drawn to, you know, transgenderism or, or whatever is the, the extreme normalcy of our day. Uh, but at the same time, do you have a right view of the Imago Dei, of being created in the image of God? Do you have a right view of uh, God as creator 
uh, and, and the rebellion that comes with someone saying, I can do it better than him, right? Do, do you have those views? Because that's where the creep starts. It, it doesn't over here. So if you're just protected from, well, I'm just never going to get to a place where I agree with this, what the world's doing, but you're already through the gate, your children will. Mm. Right? These are the realities. And Scripture warns about those things continually. So there is a measure of, of asking yourself, and this is where Scripture gets so hard. This is where expositional teaching is oftentimes so disliked because it doesn't give you that, that room to, to circumvent and avoid hard aspects of it. And when we go through Romans and we build everything till we get to Romans chapter 12, yeah. it will make even more sense... Uh, when why Paul says therefore or in light of these things by the mercy of God I, I urge you brethren uh, do this present your bodies as living sacrifices it will make much more sense when you read passages like Philippians 1 and he says for me to die is gain and when you read passages like Hebrews 11 13 to 16 and it says that if you want to return to this world if you think this is so great you can and it goes into what it means that our citizenship is in heaven. Uh, and all of that works together. You know, everybody wants to, we all, our flesh wants to pick and choose and have a favorite verse or this verse means so much to me or this text. And that's wonderful. There's nothing wrong with that as long as it's not to the exclusion of what else right. the Bible says uh, and the whole council realities of scripture. And so that would be my caution is, is recognize you might not be using your phone for sinful things. But that doesn't guarantee you already, that it's doing you good. Well, it, it, number one, it, yes. Is there a more excellent thing you could be doing than whatever it is that you're using it for? Uh, but number two, not only that, are you in a place where you can legitimately say that it's the posture of your heart mm. to offer yourself as a living sacrifice, Lord, whatever you ask of me? Whatever it is that you desire, or are you one who has made a comfort, a great big Diana-sized, that was the god of Corinth, by the way, I'm Ephesus. not just making up a name, a great big Diana-sized idol uh, in your life, and, and you don't even recognize it because it hasn't lent itself all the way unto no. what we deem sinful, but you're already in, in the midst of idolatry, which God hates, I mean, that's definitively sinful, if you've made comfort uh, the guardianship, one of the great struggles that I often hear in regards to the younger generation is love of comfort. Uh. You, you want me to do what? Uh, for how many hours in a day? And we hear these things in regards to multiple aspects. And then you read in scripture and you read about Ruth and, and Esther and Naomi. And you're like, oh, no. right. And you read about about how Samuel had to labor and Elijah had to go up against what he did. And Moses had to lead the people uh, going before Pharaoh in order to do so. And you think, oh, Noah building a boat for 110 years. Abraham departing to live in a tent and, and carry out whatever the Lord asked of him. He didn't do it perfectly. And it cost him, by the way. Sometimes we tend to say, well, nobody's perfect. Abraham lied and told you know everyone that Sarah was his sister, not his wife. And my answer is, yeah, and it didn't go well for him, right? Don't, don't look at things that, that godly men did that were sinful and use them as justification because it, it did not out. go well. David, yeah. you know, people point to David and David's wickedness with Bathsheba and Uriah. Uh, and, and not only did it cost him the life of their child, which God took from them, but even more than that, God said, because of the way you've handled yourself, in regards to women, your family is going to be in disarray in yep. your own home. And I don't even know the category that it must have been when David found himself fleeing from Absalom, his own son who was seeking to kill him. We tend to make light of that. We think, oh, you know, David did this, David did that. Yeah, but how did it go for David? Have you thought through the conclusion that Scripture is clear to tell us in regards to those things? So the creep is so dangerous. That's what I was saying about Jude. How much has crept in unawares to our Christianity? Um, you know, the example that came up this week uh, with the Christian school and different things is how much do families with children practice biblical discipline and instruction in their homes? Oh, yeah. How far are we from those realities? Uh, and I asked the question, you know, 
<clears throat> it's been a while since I raised little ones, and so I asked some of those who were in the room. I, I happened to be in a store. I'm trying to think of how much of this I should tell. I I'm, to be in a store. I'm thinking that too. I happened to be in a <laughs> store this week, and I watched a, a child literally rule an aisle, no. uh, shoes off, on the floor, screaming, rolling around, and mom was continued chopping like nothing was happening around her. And this is what got me as I thought to myself, you know, if I went up and, and explained how much that child would both benefit from and need uh, a spanking, she would probably think I'm a monster. Like literally, that's where society is at. And this is the measure of, of understanding when I say how much has crept in. How much has crept into our views of raising children that is not what scripture teaches? Do we believe that we spoil the child when we spare the rod? Do we believe that those who don't spank their children in fact hate their souls? Because that's what, teach, that's what scripture teaches. Do we believe the Bible... Or have we gotten to a place where through the sinfulness of the world, through abuse that maybe was visited upon you, you've chosen not to believe the Bible in that area because of wrong things that have, that have been societal expectations? We've chosen not to believe the Bible. Let's think for just a moment. When the early Christians were confronted with culture's desire versus what they believed they had been taught by the apostles and what God himself had said. Do you, do you know how that went? They lost everything and many of them died. Right? That's what faith does. And my fear is that we've somehow bought into a worldly view that we live in a much gentler time and that faith ought not cost us anything. And that faith ought to be something that we, we hold in high esteem until it costs us something. Well, and, and I would I would say we can even go a step farther than that and believe that if people are unhappy with our adherence to faith, we must be doing it wrong. Yeah, Which is but, even I mean, how much more does scripture when dangerous. Jesus says things like, "Beware when all men speak well of you." Right. Uh, you know, blessed are you when you're persecuted for righteousness' sake. I would say that what the Bible teaches by our Creator, who Himself gives the blessing of children who himself is sovereign over that child, what he says in regards to raising that child is what I want to do, right? And, and whether society agrees, believes, thinks I'm right, thinks I'm crazy, thinks I'm backwards, thinks I'm, you know, well, that's why you have a, don't have an iPhone, you're just backwards. You know, it's just, whatever the case may be, we're so guarded. And where does that end? So once you start down that slide and you don't like what the Bible says about this area and, and you don't want society to be at odds with you over that and so you merge just a little bit and it's more comfortable and your kids like, remember, everything society is doing, they're doing because there's a measure where their flesh desires it. So too does mine and yours. And so don't think that if you didn't give in and say, okay, we're, we're going to practice uh, discipline in a very different way. And instead of, of actually spanking our child, we're going to create a safe space for them. Right? I've heard that this works, Dr. Phil or whoever has promoted it and purported it. And we're, we're going to do this. Your child will love that until they don't. Right? Until they grow up. Until they realize that this world doesn't have safe spaces for them. But they have to get out and make life function and do those things. And they're ill-prepared for it. And that's when you'll have a child whom you've provoked. And because of the blatant disregard of God's word in that area, why in the world would they take serious anything else you're saying from it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when we get into Romans, it's why I gave you all last week some questions to ask just in chapter 1. What does Paul mean when he says, even though we believe that they are deserving of death, we ourselves promote and practice such things? What does Paul mean when he says that? I'm not going to answer that tonight. We're going to get there. But I want you all asking those questions, thinking through, meditating. When, when is the last time that, that you took, I took a portion of scripture and made it the purpose of my week to consider that portion? To consider what, what does this mean? And they, just in Romans 1, there's so much that we could point to that's worthy of that. The gospel of God. That would be a worthy week 
to spend your time just thinking on that, to, to pursue that. Right to, to think through what does it mean that the wrath of God is, is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and those who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That would be something worthy of bending your brain and, and considering. But between Amazon and YouTube and social media and other things, it is nearly impossible for this generation to do that. And that's dangerous. That's the part that, that I think we, we, we lack consideration. And again, we're not anti-technology any more than the Bible's anti-money. But it does tell us that money is an area of great danger and many men have, have made shipwreck of their faith in regards to their confidence or hope in it. Uh, money's not evil, but you better be careful. It's a dangerous area. Uh, that can grip you quickly. In the same way, uh, I would point towards technology, I would point towards a multitude of things. Just do the work. Yeah, and I would, I, I was thinking as you were talking about that, 1 Corinthians 10, where Paul talks about all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. And, and, and that becomes such a standard for, well, what do I do with this? And, and I think for me, so often the, like you said, we don't even ask the question. We don't ask the question of should I or, or not? How much? Surely not the the overtly sinful stuff, but the rest, you know, it, well, we almost treat it like over. it's up for grabs and it's I mean, not that's bled to be over into so much of church culture. Hey, look, I, it's always boggled me as a church member how little standard of expectation there is for those in a pastoral role. Mm -hmm. If they don't, you know, steal financial gain, if they don't uh, commit adultery, they're pretty much in there for life. And, and there's no examination, you know, there, there's no consideration of are they feeding me? Are they, are they caring for my soul? Are they doing these things? That, uh, that's what, it, so it, it kind of creeps in. Or there's this lowering, examination lowering of standard. worldly standard. Exactly. This idea of, well, what's the minimum? Right. right. Well, where's the line in the sand that's our minimum on this? And that scripture teaches the opposite. It says, hey, pursue excellence. Live to grow. The, Jesus tells us that if you are showing fruit, the Heavenly Father is going to prune you for the purpose of bearing more fruit. Right. This world is not our home. We are here for a season. And then we're going to what is our home. And, and there's a very great lack of that mindset within Christianity by and large in, in, in America. And I think a lot of it comes from not being able to sit back and say, well, do I, do I put worthless things before my eyes in my home? Do I, do I spend my time with excellence? Do I labor as though it's under the Lord and not as unto men? Um, and again, the answer becomes very quickly, well, but Abraham did mm. mess up in this area. And Noah, you know, he really messed up here. And David, we all know what he did. Those areas of failure ought not to be our standard. And so, you know, I want very much to live. Here's something that, that you probably or possibly haven't thought through fully when you look at the world around you. How, how many of you, and, and please I'm going to ask you if you'll raise your hand, how many of you look at the world around you and are a little bit appalled uh, and, and definitely potentially frustrated, maybe even scared? a little bit of where the world's going around us. Can I get, is it, there's a, okay, I've got, I've got a few of you and I've talked to several of you. I know that there's a measure where you look around and say, what in the world yeah. um, is going on? But here's what I would say to you. Have you ever thought about that the blacker the landscape gets, the brighter you can shine your light? But if you're creeping along with them, there's no light. Right? All you're doing is, is, is shining further into where they're heading. Instead of setting yourself apart and saying, no, this... And so I desperately want, when people come into this church on a Sunday morning, for them to experience something other than emojis and text messages as though that's somehow the measure of relationship. I want them to have genuine depth and feeling and interaction and, and relationship opportunities. I want them to come in, if they're unbelievers who maybe were invited or something else has led them here, and I want them to come in and go, I've never seen anything like this in my life. This is not what I experience at work. This is not what it's like in my family. This is not what I've been living for. And that doesn't happen if we're merging ourselves just a little bit for comfort's sake and other things. Well, you know what's wild? This goes back in a different direction, but 
<laughs> the the world wants what in on their own terms the world wants what Christianity has promised to provide of course and and the world is so ready through its own machinations or through the the schemes of the devil to provide a counterfeit um, one of the I think one of the ways I saw this cl most clearly a couple years ago and, and I see it again I, it was something that came up actually my wife and I in conversation uh, today everyone is looking for a community everybody is looking for and you see that whether it's book clubs teams uh, gym uh, buddy systems the <clears throat> and it, and they they borrow language the hey I'm, I'm just keeping you accountable hey we need that fellowship we need that time together you know whether that's a fraternity or, or, or a, a cohort of people who are all in the same profession it's the same language and it's a cheap thin imitation of the reality which means that if we are going to do what we've been called to do, we, we have to be more than the cheap, thin reality, the uh, imitation. We have to be the reality. There has to be the yeah. substance behind it. And, and here's the cool thing. In studying Ecclesiastes, it was abundantly clear that what Solomon, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was declaring is life under the sun's broken, mm. but there are measures of enjoyment that we ought to be yep. bringing to it every day. Right? There, there are parts and aspects of this life until heaven that because of heaven I recognize how it's not that but I also recognize the blessings of God and, and the means by which he's accomplished that through giving us a lamp and a light for the for the journey that we're in through giving us a community of fellowship wherein we can uh, go to one another and serve one another and be served by one another uh, wherein we have uh, marriage and and babies being born and, and next generations coming up and Titus 2's influence into those generations and missions going forth and, and there is so much. I gave uh, some of the guys that I meet with this week, I gave them the challenge of waking up every day and coming up with that day as they start their day, five things they're thankful for. Uh, and I challenge them to have at least two or three of them that are specific to the person and work of Jesus Christ. Because circumstances can't shake that. Mm. Circumstances don't change that. Now, it's fine if you wake up and say, I, I'm, I've been sick for a week and I'm not sick today. I'm really thankful for that. That's great. That's a wonderful circumstance that ought to drive you to be thankful. But I'm saying, of those five, make at least two of them something that's not able to be shifted. Uh, because our flesh does not intentionally, if you were to take the average person who's oh. left to their own flesh and feelings, on a 365 day year and you were to uh, measure how many of those days they had a posture of thankfulness uh, it would be somewhere uh, less than 25 percent the bend of our flesh is not bent towards thankfulness now that 25 percent would be maybe on their birthday they wake up and be thankful maybe uh, maybe if they got a raise at work they'd wake up and be thankful for two or three days Maybe if they got a new vehicle, they'd wake up and be thankful for, you know, I'm so excited about this or a new house or whatever. But the general posture over a 365-day year is going to be 75%. This hurts and this isn't working and so-and-so is not nice and my boss didn't do this and so-and-so is being advanced and I'm doing harder work than they are. And it's just that that's the bend of who we are. And so this exercise is given so that we will intention. If you're not intentional to break yourself out from that and you just let your flesh lead you, it will. It will. And it will look just like the rest of the world. They have the same flesh. Uh, it will lead you into the opposite of thankfulness. Uh, the other thing I gave them was examine. This is from Sunday sermon. Just examine your impact and reputation you've been building the last 24 to 48 hours. You, we tend to... Uh, act in a certain way um, and, and then move on and we, not, we don't necessarily think about it. You know, Tanya and I might have had a tiff yesterday and, and so everybody in staff meeting paid for it, right? And, and then her and I made up and we're better and so I forgot about that and moved on but the people in the staff meeting didn't. If I force myself to examine and say what kind of reputation, what kind of impact did I have the last 24 hours, it gives me the opportunity to examine and correct those things which is absolutely necessary uh, for the life of faith, salt and light that I'm striving and have a desire to do. But if I don't do the work, desire is not enough. 
Desire is never enough. You have to do the work that comes with it. And then the third thing was, uh, I challenged them to pray for five people this week that they normally don't. Add five people to your prayer list that, that you don't pray for on a normal basis, outside of your family, outside of whatever. And if there's someone specifically that you don't want to pray for, they should be at the top of that list. Uh, and so those are just some, some practical ways to do, uh, to put to death that which is earthly within us, uh, to grow uh, in grace and truth, uh, to, to grow in peace. Um, we want these things, but we want them on our terms according to what the world's given us, and, and it doesn't work. And, and that's where I just want to keep going back to. Whatever the case may be, whether it, technology is an area that can be a wonderful tool, Again, nothing here that's saying technology in and of itself is wicked or evil or any of those things. But it could also easily become an idolatrous means of creeping into areas of sin, of being less of a living sacrifice and more of a something I, I don't even know. Um, and so just doing the work to examine, thinking through these things well, not just going along with, well, everybody's got an iPhone, of course I have to have an iPhone. Everyone's got a computer, everyone has, you know, a mortgage and it's been refinanced three times and they have two homes and people will come to me oftentimes and they'll say, you know, I, well, well, we both have to work to do this and I'm like, well, you probably do both have to work to do what it is that you're doing, but that doesn't mean it's what you ought to be doing. Right? It doesn't mean you have to be doing that. It means you've chosen certain things that have created that. Or potentially, it could be that you actually do have to. Maybe medical bills, maybe bad decisions in the past, it, any number of things. So again, it's not a, here's the standard, thou shalt not do this. It's the standard of thou shalt examine thyself daily for the purpose of putting off uh, the old self with its corruption and putting on the new man uh, who's being renewed day by day. So let's talk a little bit about that for a second. <laughs> Healthy self-suspicion. Oh, yeah. We don't have it. Now, I, I, I want you to talk about that in light of the way that our society also promotes, and you just, you have a self-image problem. Yeah, so, you need so to think more of yourself. our culture has come to believe that the greatest struggle facing culture over the past however many centuries is a lack of self-esteem, which is in direct contradiction to what Scripture teaches. Scripture teaches that one who esteems self too much <laughs> is one who has not met the risen Lord, right? That's not been humbled, has not bent their knee, has not surrendered. One who esteems self too much is one who's not humble, uh, who's not contrite, who's not tremble at his word. Uh, and yet our society and culture is constantly pushing this. And this is where it's such an easy place to look and, and say this. In this generation, and this is a horrible statistic, but again, it's, it's just a statistic. In this generation, our children have more available to them than any other generation in the history of the world. More comfort, more opportunity, more entertainment more you fill in the blank available to them than has ever existed before in the history of the world. And the suicide rate among teenagers is more than double what it was 40 years ago. So the world's answer is no answer. Right. That's clear. But the problem is, and this is where Satan has done such a stellar job at what it is that he does, is we look at it and think, yeah, but if it was just this, right, that's how it goes here. But if we could just change this a little bit, if I, if I could just leave it in the other room, if I could just do that, you know, if I just didn't take it as far as I'm not Tweak it just case. a little bit. But what happens then is the world who's suffering under that failure of all that they were promised would provide for them, and by world I mean unbelievers, and then they come into the church and they see people who might not have those things, but really desperately wish they did. Mm. Why would they? Why would they, they? They look at us and say, well, I've, "I'm just—they're the same miserable person as me. Uh, they just, you know, have something that maybe future, and I'm just going to keep. Why would I give up my Sunday when they wish they could be out on the boat with me, uh, and so on and so forth? So that's the." It, it destroys evangelism, it destroys sanctification, it destroys a multitude of things, which would never be the intent of anyone who comes into a church on Sunday, that they would ever harm those things. They would say, I'm here to uphold that. But the problem is, is when it's merged in that way, it does the opposite. Well, I think so much of that comes down to, as well, 
we, we don't search the scriptures for these things. Mm -mm. We don't search the scriptures and, and we're so, our eyes are so accustomed to the darkness that the, the pen light that we know of God's word is like, wow, that's, that's impressive. Not realizing, no, it's, it's, it's to be a lighthouse. It's to be this, you know, magnitudes greater shining into all of the groping around in the darkness that, that we had been doing in our previous life and that the world is continuing to do. And, and when we neglect that, when we just are content with the pen light and, and think, man, we're doing really good because we have more light than the guy down the street. We have more light than that family member that's just, I mean, absolutely botching it up. The world is not our standard. Right. It's just not. If we can learn that, then we can start looking, well, what is our standard? Right. We, have to, we have to become convinced of that. This world is not our standard. The world's expectations, the world's methods, the world's means, and make no mistake, they are the methods, means, and expectations because human flesh desires them. So don't think that it's going to be, like I said, for me, making the decision I made, it's not the decision for everyone, but it was the right one for me. And it was like weaning a kid off of sugar. It was not an easy two weeks of my life. It was constantly like, what am I doing? I really? Uh, but there was an amazing offset, too, of, wow, this already is making a difference. I already see greater depth in, in, in relationship. I already, already see less distraction, which building uh, into my family and home life. I mean, I'm already seeing greater diligence, and, and it's, it's rough. I mean, I have to plan ahead. Who knew? You know, with that silly phone I had, I didn't have to plan ahead. I could live by the seat of my pants every day according to whatever showed up, I could handle it. I could change and shift and, and affect and let people know and get the word out and do those things. And, and there was no need for any real discipline. And again, this was me. This is not something that I'm pointing at you. If you're sitting there going, I think he's talking to me. I don't know that I'm talking to you. I'm talking to me. And if you're hearing it, then you should pay attention. Uh, but it's not something that I'm saying everyone has to follow this. I'm saying everyone should examine and really see, is what am I doing with that extra time? How is it affecting me? What are some ways that, that I can serve? And like, Do you know that it says in Scripture it's better to give than receive? Do you know what a contradiction that is to the human flesh? Do you, do, I mean, have you ever really thought about that? Do you know what a contradiction that is to the human flesh? But if you've ever labored to make that your practice, you know that Scripture is true. You know it because you've experienced it. But you've got to fight your flesh to get there. That's just one small example of 10,000 beautiful things that we've been given here for the life that we're called to live until heaven. And then this has done its work and we're, we've arrived. You know, there, <clears throat> there's a part of this where I want to try to wrangle this back into the original question with the time that we have. That's fine. But... Uh, I think so much of the questions that arise do come down to, am, am I thinking through it biblically? You know, there, there's not, and this goes back to uh, what I mentioned earlier, the, our heart's desire for legalism, for a checklist. We, oh, yeah, we, we don't want to do the hard work of searching the scriptures. It'd be so much easier if you just told me, <laughs> hey, go, go get rid of your phone because that's, that's more holy. It, that, then I wouldn't have to do the work of examination. Then I wouldn't have to do the work of, am I doing this according to a biblical principle, a biblical practice? Am I actually doing that? Rather, I can just conform to your standard rather than a biblical one. I mean, it's the same. It, it goes back to the idea of, I don't know when Satan fostered this, but there came a time, sometime in the history of the church, where it became believed that Christianity was intended to make life in this world easier. But then you pick this up and you, and you read it and you're like, wait a second, how did it go for Haggai? Not so well. What about, what about Hosea? Mm. Uh, maybe, maybe it went better for, for Peter. Uh, no, actually it didn't. Uh, maybe Paul's life, right? He became a Christian on the Damascus Road. Certainly things got easier for Paul after that, right? He was a Pharisee. Certainly not being a Pharisee anymore freed him up to enjoy the good things in life and, and all that. And, and no, the, everything I read in here is the opposite of that mindset uh, in regards to, to those things. This idea that Christianity is not a daily dogfight. For my own sanctification, it's not a, a daily 
I've got to do the work. And here's the, the thing. The work is easy in true comparison to the other enslaving realities, which is this world. You see, the world promises, and it does so in accordance with our flesh, so it seems easier. It seems like a quick answer. It seems like the, the easy answer. It seems like it's greater freedom. And ultimately, it just destroys and enslaves all the more. Whereas Scripture is more of that laying aside those things at the forefront to see the benefit through that process. Freedom through submission. Yeah, I mean, Scripture, if you look at when Lazarus was raised from the dead, Jesus made an amazing statement. He says, if you believe, then you'll see. Mm -hmm. Right? And we want everyone wants to be shown that this is going to work out well. I, I, there's no promise in Scripture that your earthly existence is going to work out well. As a matter of fact, it would be unsurprising to me if everyone in this room that stood true to their faith didn't actually pay a great cost for it between here and heaven. Uh, that it might cost you friendship. That it will cost you family uh, relationships. That it will cost you job opportunities. And it will cost you financial means. And it will cost you uh, possibly your freedom and even your life. Uh, that would not be surprising to me in regards to what scripture has taught no. us. But it would be shocking in the moments to the majority of people who, who come and flock to churches mm. uh, every week. And that's the mindset of just for me as a pastor, uh, I don't want us to face persecution at all, just so we're clear. I'm not up here saying, man, I just it, it's coming and I'm excited about it. I don't want that to be the case. But I also don't want people to be absent from persecution, to believe that Christianity is a protection from persecution when it's the opposite, to the degree that they deny their faith, stand before the Lord, and go to hell for eternity. That would be much worse. And so how do we find that balance of walking well in regards to these things? And it goes to Scripture. So with the time we've got left, why don't you walk through a couple of biblical filters or biblical cautions that as... And, and we'll bring it back into kind of the home as we're establishing guidelines for technology with kids, family life. Some biblical cautions and filters that we ought to have in place to do some work of examination. Yeah. Uh, in regard to technology? Yes. Yeah. Specifically for that. Specifically. I know some questions that come in regarding that. So some basic filters are what's your standard for why your child has access to that? Is it so that you have greater ease? Uh, whereas being a parent is hard. Is it because you want them to keep up with the other kids of their generation? Uh, that's not going well, right? There's a measure where, where when I think through pros, cons, and, and ins and outs, and, and this could apply to a thousand different things. This right. could apply to, to sports. This could apply to... The shoes uh, they get. Uh, do what? The shoes they get, the to, clothes to they're all wearing. all manner yeah. of things. Uh, this could apply to, to the way that you ought to examine it is in accordance with Scripture. Is this something that I'm doing for this to the contradiction of Scripture? That's where the simplicity of it comes in. Is this so I can be less of a parent that I have them have this? Right? Is this so that I don't have to be as involved in their life that I give them this to have that? Is this so that they can fit in with the other unbelieving children? Uh, and, and in the process of doing that, I'm inviting in uh, a gateway that they are by no means mature enough to handle uh, in those things. Um, and, and I'm not even talking about uh, just pornography and other things. I'm talking about social media and relationships that are so uh, coming at you so quickly with, uh, you know, you, you read uh, about a disaster that happened and 400 people were killed in an earthquake and then there's a cartoon that follows it. And, and it's totally debasing our ability to rightly uh, feel and see and experience things. And, and you give that to an eight-year-old and what have you done? And, and we could go on, but I an example that stands out to me just as, a, as an example of this. It's a different scenario. But when I first started teaching in student ministry uh, and began teaching on what really for, for a middle and high school child is probably the most important thing to them uh, in, in that season of their life and it's, it's opposite sex relationship. And, and we live in a society and in a time when marriage is absolutely a mockery. Uh, it's so under viewed that now it's it's 
it's not even marriage anymore, right? It's not even remotely what God intended for it to be in our society around us. And so we're, we're failing uh, pretty significantly in that. And, and so I begin looking at scripture and saying, okay, it doesn't say, you won't find the word dating uh, in scripture, but you do find very simple principles. What is God's design for opposite sex relationship of a romantic sort? It's called marriage. He's pretty clear on that. He has a lot to say about that. Now, the means to get someone there, how do we do so in a way that fulfills the other principles of Scripture and arrives as safely and intact as possible and as prepared as possible for that? And so just asking that question uh, and beginning to go against the status quo of how things were always done in an abject failure uh, of outcome, I just remember there's a couple of folks in here that were in the student ministry back then. And it's like a bomb went off. And here's the scary part. It wasn't just the kids. I had parents calling me. Hey, you're you're going to make my child a social reject, you know, because you're you're cautioning them in areas that are that are way outside the norm. And I'm like, well, I'm just trying to teach them what the Bible says. And, and literally, it was not uncommon to have a parent say to me, I really don't care what the Bible says. This is what my plans are for my child. And you're hindering that by teaching these things. And you hear that, and it is a little bit shocking, but at the same time, when you look at that measurement, how did that happen? It, well, it crept in right. one little step at a time where there wasn't that examination, there wasn't that care. And so when it comes down to in your home, if you're a husband here today, are you leading your home? Are you practicing Ephesians 5? Are you leading your home with gentleness, with patience? Are you leading in the way that, that you're actually functioning to do that? Are you leading in a way that points your home more towards Christ? If you're a wife here today, are you submitted to your husband's leadership in support of and a help me to him as he's striving for those things? Is that happening? If that's not happening, then me trying to tell you what's wrong with your children We've already skipped some massive areas and tried to parachute into something that we, it doesn't function. It, it, until we get to a place where Ephesians 5, 1 Corinthians 7, Genesis 3, right? These, 1 Peter 3, 1 to 7, these passages that are describing and detailing what the home at the parental marriage level ought to look like, we can't get to the rest of it. And you say, well, what do we do if it's, if it's broken? What if I'm a single mom? What if I'm a single dad? What if, what if those things? And that's where Hebrews is so, I'm so thankful when it says that in our hour of need, we come before his throne of grace and he provides that which is sufficient for those things. It's not as though God doesn't look at this world and know how broken it is. It's not as though your circumstances are apart from, from his care and provision. And so, you know, what I am saying, though, is if you're a single mom, are you doing that to the, to the extent of, of viewing it through the lens of society or through the lens of Scripture? Uh, if you're a single dad, are you viewing it through the lens of society or the lens of Scripture? Um, you know, recognizing limitations. People say, well, what about this situation? Scripture addresses that. You might not like what it has to say. It might really cost you uh, what the world could offer you to do it their way. Uh, you, you might have to give up a lot in order to honor scripture in this area. And that's where, coming back to, I don't understand how we've shifted so far from recognizing that's always the way it is. That's, that's not unusual in the pages of scripture, that there is a cost to the killing of our flesh. Because it doesn't like it. It dies hard. Yep. And it, it's like, you know, the, the horror movies where the, the, the bad guy dies and they make a sequel. Then they kill him again and they make another sequel. That's how our flesh is. You, you might do a really good job of putting it to death today and it, it'll rear its ugly head next week. And, and sometimes stronger. Uh, and so we have to constantly be in that taking up our cross daily, examining these things daily, fighting for these things daily, being intentional daily because it's not the natural bend of our flesh. Just as an example to be thankful. Right. Our flesh is bent to the opposite. Our flesh is bent to grumble. Our flesh is bent to complain. Our flesh is bent to look out for number one. Our flesh is bent that way. We have to do work to make it conform to this. Paul uses the example. He says, I beat my body into submission. Yeah. So I, again, I just think that those are, so when you think through in the home, ask yourself, 
what are my motives? What, what's the benefit of this? Why do I think that my child needs, uh, you know, an Screen iPad, tough. an iPhone, and an Apple Watch by the time they're 12? Why do I think they need that, right? The, the, maybe there's a legitimate reason. Maybe your child is, 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 you know, they're driving to work by the time they're 14, and so they desperately need something to help them get there more safely, and you can stay in contact with them. Uh, maybe that's real. I doubt it, but maybe. And again, I, here at the school, I mean, we've just seen so many. We live in a time where everyone wants to know, well, we're in a technological age. If our kids don't grow in technology, they're going to be stunted as adults. And I look at what technology is, in fact, visiting upon our 12-year-olds, and I say, bunk. It's not true. It's just not true. Well, and uh, the, like you talked about the maturity to, to handle something. Mm -hmm. You know, we wouldn't go down to the nurse and unload a pack of power tools and say, hey, here, here you go. No, skill saw is not sinful, but you probably should have some experience and some growth and some teaching on how to use it. We live in a society that thinks technology is harmless, even though they know it's not. And so it's common around us to just, here you go. Yeah. Um, and, and so, again, I don't think we've probably answered every specific detailed question, but I hope we've given you a foundation to think through as you're considering those things for your own children, for your own home. Uh, and, and again, getting back to Scripture. Um, before... Listen, is it wrong for your children to watch a cartoon uh, while you're trying to get dinner cooked or something? No, I'm not saying that's wrong. What I am saying is, did you also have family worship with them where they were instructed in, in, in the realities of Christ, where they were brought together as a family and other things, or was it just all one thing? As long as this is being accomplished, and then this is a helpful tool and resource in the midst of it, great. Well, and I would also point scripturally back to that's where we're so blessed with mm. things like Titus 2. It, we're, ju we're not just navigating this on our own. We're not just navigating this from, you know, the, the vantage point of well, what, am, what do my peers think? What do my peers say? What is, what is the latest, you know, word from those who are stumbling around in the darkness? If I have those who are in that Titus 2 role, who are demonstrating those godly characteristics who've walked that path ahead of me maybe they've walked it imperfectly but they're going to be able to tell me that yeah. then that's a, a massive uh, asset to navigating those things uh, you know if I could just give you going back to our parenting seminars we've done right. there's two basic things you have to teach your children as parents you have to teach them number one that you are the authority that has to be established from the youngest of ages you are the authority Secondly, you have to teach them they can trust your authority. Mm. You, you're not there to harm them. So when you make decisions they don't like, they're not in charge. You're the authority. They're not going to like. If they like half the decisions you made, you probably didn't do it well. <laughs> That's the nature of what it means that you've been instructed and entrusted with raising one up to a point of maturity. Then the flip side of that is they have to know that you love them, that you care for them, that you're laboring on their behalf in those things. Even if they don't like it in the moment. So... Again, in the limited time we have, we did a whole parenting seminar yep. on those two principles. It's available on our website, uh, but that's the simplicity. Teach your children that you're their authority, not them, and secondly, that they can trust your authority. Uh, if you do those two things, the rest of it's going to be to some degree okay. It doesn't guarantee their conversion, uh, but it does guarantee that your role as the parent in their life. Why don't you go ahead and close this in a word of prayer? Lord, we are thankful uh, for the grace that you've given us that is your word. Uh, and Lord, we confess that, that we generally know very little of what your word has actually said. Uh, and so Lord, I pray that we would, by your strength, work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it's you who works in us uh, as we do the labor that you've called us to, recognizing that simply having a desire to serve you, a desire to raise godly children, a desire to love our wives and submit to our husbands, that desire is not sufficient. We must bring application, labor, and work to bear on those things. And so Lord, I pray for those who are here that they would be more fully edified and sanctified because of our time tonight speaking of subjects that are that are before many of us in a multitude of ways. And even if we're not struggling with technology, I know some people in this room 
I already have a flip phone. Uh, it's not really a struggle, but Lord, how easily pride could creep in where we would feel that, that because we have a flip phone that we're set apart. Lord, we can never escape from doing the work of examining our hearts, which are wicked and are pumping out uh, idols daily. Uh, one pastor having called them idol factories. Lord, we, we agree with that statement and, and recognize that your word has given us the means to examine and guard ourselves uh, against uh, these things taking hold of us. Lord, I thank you for those who are here. And Lord, I pray that we would be strengthened uh, because of these truths. In Christ's name, amen.